Welcome to Directly Correct, a Pimo's podcast with Colin Scott. Today's guest, Jen Diamond Acosta, Global Skills Lead at Kentview. Thanks to our sponsors, Lightcast. The world is full of talent data, but more data can lead to more questions, uncertainty, and stagnation as organizations sift through it to figure out what's fact from what's fiction. Lightcast's talent intelligence platform answers your most difficult workforce questions to drive meaningful business results. With more than 20 years of experience as MC and Burning Glass, Lightcast accelerates your work, bringing together hundreds of billions of vetted, constantly updated data points and incredible insights to drive strategic talent decisions. Your organization can tap into the deepest open repository of skills, supply and demand data in the world to transform your hunches into a skills-based future for your organization. Lightcast's flexible solution, used by 67 of the Fortune 100, can integrate your own data, be guided by in-house talent experts, and give you the tools and confidence to explore it for yourself. To learn more, book a demo at lightcast.io. All opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. Well, Jen, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. These are the, the good times. <laughs> when did we meet? Cole, you and I met in 2015. We were in a PSYOP symposium together on yes. predicting retirement. That's what it was. Okay, because yeah. I was like, I know we had a connection. I actually have, I have a, a, a story. I, I forgot that you were the genesis of the story. I forgot about this. Um, tell me. I have I a story I tell about you. Do you mind if I tell it real quick? Please tell it. I can't wait to hear it. Hopefully, I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> but it'd be good to actually finally give you credit because I haven't. I've, I've forgotten who this happened with. Um, but we were doing. I always tell the story of uh, I had a psyop symposium where I had put together three really robust like, and this is when machine learning was still new. Like machine learning models of predicting, you know, turnover and retirements. And I was really proud of, you know, the coefficients that I had. And it was like, you know, so predictive. And this was like kind of cutting edge at the time. And then I presented on a PSYOP panel and the other person on that panel, which happened to be you, Jen, said, well, our organization just asked managers um, how likely they thought a person like quit. And your predictions were higher than mine. And I had three different <laughs> models. That I had in, and I was like, Ah, oh. <laughs> it's such a crappy feeling, but it's one of those things where I say like, you know, sometimes human intuition is actually still helpful in the age of machine learning. Yeah. And you know what? I was listening to one of your recent episodes where you had Ryan Hammond from Haiku. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And I actually rem had the same memory and I tied it back to that experience because he was talking about how their prediction with like all of their fancy data, right, of uh, attrition or likelihood to job search, right, was similar in magnitude to just asking people. But the key point was it was explaining different variants, right? And so it was still valuable mm -hmm. because when you bring, when you do both, right, if you were to ask people and look at that data, you would get a stronger prediction. And so it's so funny that you bring that story up because I, was just thinking about that as I was listening to some of your recent episodes. <laughs> so that's I mean, the connection this, this, we should have made. Is it is it predicting <laughs> different variants, right? <laughs> or is it simply redundant? Yeah, if, if your model doesn't work, just like change the predictive criteria, right? Like we're not actually trying to predict this. We're trying to predict why. On um, yeah, could also also be a route you could go. <laughs> I'm not even willing to give my model enough credit to say that it might have been predicting other stuff. <laughs> Looking back in retrospect, it probably just wasn't that good. But, you know, tomato, tomato, right? Well, I mean, this, this is where I think humans... we had about one person show up to that session, though, right? Like, it was the very last session of the conference on a Saturday afternoon when the conference was ending or something like that. So I don't know, Jen. My recollection is there was hundreds of people there who were all desperately interested in what we had to say. I, I don't know. Right. One, we'll one of us is I, it, was, it was the time slot. I, do, I think the session was interesting, but the time slot was not doing us favors. <laughs> a, a, a nice Saturday session. I mean, like the sigh of God just don't shine on you, right? Yeah, exactly. It was back when the format was a little bit different and they'd go all day on Saturday, but everyone would fly out. 
So nobody would go to the last session. I mean, there have been times when I've been, felt less than prepared and be like, oh, shit, I hope no one really shows up to this. This could be really <laughs> bad. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I not something relate. I've ever done. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> now I can well, definitely like, relate. Well, last year, some poor saps had the fire alarm pulled on them in Boston, right? Oh, that's right. That's right. It was yeah. like a four o'clock session. They tried to restart it like an hour and a half later. It's like, no, everyone's at dinner at the bar. There's no way. People had moved on at that point. <laughs> I was actually at a happy hour with one of our previous guests when that happened. I had no clue it even happened <laughs> until the next day. Um, but yeah, that was fun. Are you going to PSYOP, Jen? I am. I am. Yeah, it's right in my hometown. So nice and easy for me to get there this year. Any, I assume you're all going. Presentations to... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I have one, I have one session this year, which I think is the sweet spot. Like I like to really balance the <laughs> amount of time I spend contributing to Sayat with the amount of time I spend enjoying it. Right. So I have one session and it is focused on, actually it's related to some broader work I'm doing with Sayat around building resources to better prepare students to pursue practitioner careers and to prepare like early career practitioners to be successful that first year or two out. So that's what, that's the focus of the session and should be good. Good people in it. How about you all? You're you're doing an episode, right? We we have a, we have a pod. Yeah, absolutely absolutely. Uh, we're going to pimp that later. And in fact, I don't even know if we know what we're talking about yet. Okay. I mean, we know what we submitted to Sia, but we don't know what we're talking about, and just to be clear. <laughs> but, uh, Scott, do you have any other sessions other than um, the Direction of Correct? I do have a session. It's an alternative session, which I wish I wish Sia would do more of these alternative sessions. I feel, I feel burned by some of the regular symposiums where people get up. It's like, this one's about space exploration and how we can train teams. It's like, you get there, it's like, no, nah, it's not really the bag of goods that I was sold. But yeah, yeah, I, I have an alternative session. It's going to be like a game show format where people change their minds. Like someone will come up with a crazy idea and try and convince people in the audience to change their minds. More on that later. I, th- I, think, it's a, I think it's a Saturday session. That's awesome. That sounds so fun. I, I, think, I think we need more of this, right? More like engaging content. Absolutely. I mean, Saif says they want more of that, right? So that sounds oh. like an amazing session. <laughs> I mean, what we say and what we do are often times. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but yeah, like, and I think you had a similar idea a few years ago, Scott, didn't you? I yeah, we, we had a similar idea and it, it got uh, killed and somewhere in the process. I never got a review letter from uh, the uh, 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 reviewers. It just got killed. I just got like a no. <laughs> you're, you're not, not included. No feedback? See, no feedback. Yeah. I see this as a win, Scott, because what that tells me is that there's an evolution going on, whereas you could submit a similar idea years later and not only it be accepted, but it, it's a really cool idea. So, In, in, in fairness, I had to change the title this year. I think I think the title of the last one was Iowa Sake Was Dead, which may have been pushing the envelope just a little bit. For <laughs> just <science. a> little <laughs> bit. <laughs> but I, I but I put it out on Twitter, uh, like, hey, has anyone got like a crazy IO idea that they wanted to defend on stage? And I have got so many responses to that. It's been you know six years, but it's still the highest like like and comment chain I've ever seen on Twitter for myself. Not not anybody clearly. Can you give us a spoiler on like what's one of the crazy ideas? Uh, I, I heard from a uh, professor that's going to be uh, attending, and it was around uh, the well. Okay, this this aligns exactly with what your symposium is like: the future of work as an IO. Like, how are we going to train IOs in the future, and what does like all the Gen AI mean for us? And you know, just the increasing pace of technology. How are we going to train IOs? What do we actually need to know? This sort of stuff. Cool. Like another one could be like, I don't know, leadership theory is total shit. <laughs> is our psychology dead? <laughs> is our psychology dead? Is it just people analytics? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's funny. Now, I've, got, um, I've got two others, actually. Um, I got one on uh, doing like IO podcasts. 
you know, which is kind of fun. It's like very similar to what we're doing right now. Very meta podcast, meta yeah. session. But it's with, uh, I think, three or four other people that also have our related podcasts. So I think it should be pretty interesting. And yeah. then, um, and then the other one is this is actually something I tagged on to last year, but they've been running, I think for five or six years, there's a group of folks that are, um, trying to like help, uh, Iowa psychologists, how to get into a career in people analytics. And so it's like Chris Sarasoli, Anthony Ferreras, Kristen Sabo, Hannah Markle Goldstein, and they've got this kind of like really, you know, rock star group that they, you know, graciously added me into last year that. I don't know. It would just be cool to talk about, you know, how do IOs get into people analytics and do it effectively. How do you all differentiate that? Like, how are you differentiating IO from people analytics? I think it's just like what's not people analytics, you know, like people who are doing like OD work or, you know, like, I don't know, like all the O stuff that I've never done (laughs) in my career. Like all, all that stuff is what's not people analytics. And I think a lot of people think it, what they really mean is like, how do IOs become like data scientists, which is okay. a very kind of different question. It seems like a uh, um, bold career move right now with as technology advances. Like, do you want to be an IO that's also a data scientist as it were? Why, why is it bold? Just out of curiosity. Is it bold? Because you no longer really need to know how to program, right? You, you, it, that, that those skills are being eaten away. Are they being eaten away or have they been eaten? Because this is the thing that I, I, I come across, which is like people keep saying what the future will hold, but yeah. what, what is actually the present? Have they been eaten already or will they be? Currently, you still need, like you can't just totally rely on um, you know, Gen AI or you know, Chat GPT, something like that to write code for you because it invariably breaks. It's not good enough if you don't know what you're doing. So you, you need some basic foundational skills. But I, I would say that uh, you need to be really good at theory. I think that that's the goal for the future. Have a really good mental model of various components of IOSAG, be it org entry, org exit, performance, et cetera. Man, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, it's actually so fascinating to me, Scott, that that's what you're pinpointing as critical for the future. Because how often do you all talk about theory in your day job? <sighs> Theory. I, I ironically like I, I just recently referenced like Stodgill, like uh, nineteen forty six okay. leadership theory, just to make the point that trait leadership isn't where it's at. But at least having the lineage, the knowledge, the background, this sort of stuff uh, is really helpful. Also, when you're dealing with people that with their orientation is to throw everything into a model and just let XG boost go ham on it and at the end of the day it you comes out with a set of variables and you're like that's great but how would we re- recreate it what's the logical path that's following to get this outcome and it's like i don't know it's got a really high rimsy value you know really low rimsy value whatever it is and you say like yeah. well that's great really good r squared what does it mean the area under the curve was really good. yeah it's so good. Our confusion oh, matrix is so sweet. The it's sweetest. just so good. I mean, the goodness of it is just good. Our sensitivity and our recall are just, uh. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I'll say insofar as this podcast is my day job, you know, sometimes. <laughs> um, but in the workplace, very rarely, if never. Yeah. I mean, I think our job as IO psychologists is to know that theory. And to be able to distill the concepts and learnings from those theories into really simple recommendations, right? And not yeah. bring your leadership through through the muck and the logic of the theory that got you there. So I think maybe that's the story, right? Like we need, like knowing those theoretical frameworks is important. It is a differentiating skill, but you don't see it, observe it day to day. Yeah, it's- yeah I, want to, I actually want to revise what I just said. Um, I use it all the time, but it's based in my lines of critical thinking, not explicitly like, well, we're referencing Locke and Latham's, you know, uh, whatever, uh, the goal setting setting theory. I'm just going to use goals to set for my team, right? Like, and so it's not explicitly stated. It's just embedded within the, I don't know, the air we breathe, let's call it. Yeah. And the fabric of how we do our 
Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times the models are too complicated to use anyway. So, I mean, like if you just find an article you like that has a really good finding, like you can use bits and pieces of say like the entire overall arching research, such as the high performance cycle, like you mentioned, you can use some certain sort of set high specific goals. That's pretty easy to implement, but they're trying to do the entire cycle. I mean, hell that thing goes all the way through organizational exit, I believe. And then now even alumni programs, like that's like the new thing. Um, you know, trying to analyze how people that used to work for you feel about you and would they be willing to come back. But uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously. How's that um, going? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get a call back. Can't get a call back. But uh, well, I'm, I'm curious, Jen, um, you're doing work, I, I think, and, and I actually, I would love for you to kind of explain this. Um, what I would thought would have been called like traditional IO work in the skills space. But it seems like, like everyone that are non IO psychologists just discovered skills a few years ago and think it's like this new thing. So can you tell us like, what, what is this new thing? And is it the same as the old thing? Is it something different? Like what, what's sure. going on there? Sure. Yeah. And I love that lead in. I always start by saying skills are not new. We've known about skills for decades and decades and decades, right? And we've always wanted to hire people based on skills and promote people based on skills, et cetera. The obstacle that we faced was around the impracticality of having, of, of, of getting and use and maintaining a database of useful skill data about oh, our yeah. talent, the skills that our people have, and the skills that we need, right? Um, and the effort that that would have taken in the past to maintain that data was just, it was not worth it. Um, what's different now is the advan advancements that we've seen in AI have made it possible to automate at least a first pass at generating that database, right? And so I, I caution us to, to say AI has come and automated it all, right? Because we want to be really careful about um you know, how much we rely on AI to measure the skills of our people or attributes of our people. So I always have a guiding principle around we start with AI and we validate with human when we look at AI measurement. I mean, we have we have such a resource with like ONET, right? It already has, gives a mm -hmm. good like start, you know, head start on this sort of stuff and just like adding in uh, the, the AI to constantly update our libraries is great. I, I think that some of the pushback you get with say skills is it, it takes a lot of forethought, not, not, not necessarily in collecting the skills from the people, which really, it sucks, <laughs> unless you're using some sort of gen AI. But people really have to think about what, do my, what does my organization need to look like in three years? What it needs to look like in five years? What kind yeah. of skills are emerging? What, what do we not have? I guess that kind of goes along with, you know, uh, is a secondary consideration. But I, I, I really feel that people just don't want to put in the work, right, to do hardcore like skills-based hiring and selection. Yeah, you bring up an, another really good point about that future focus, right? I think that's the other thing that's the impetus to start really focusing on skills now is that yeah. we're hitting this threshold where for, for so long, we were always like the pace of change that we're experiencing now is the slowest pace of change that we're ever going to experience. But <laughs> now we're like really seeing that come to life all of a sudden with how rapidly skills are becoming outdated, how rapidly new skills are coming into the market and becoming in demand. Like two years ago, there was no generative, generative AI. I mean, there was somewhere, but we didn't yeah, know yeah, about yeah. This, like, like, uh, you know, prompt building for generative AI and things like that. Just like, and suddenly we're actually seeing it come to life. And it's this uncertainty around the skills that companies are going to need in the future, and we're talking like next year, two years out, right? In the short term future, it is also driving this whole charge to get this better data on skills so that we can, you know, we can analyze it and we can better create an agile workforce that can upskill, reskill, pivot, change priorities so we can get the right skills in the right place when we need it. I mean, like, what, what differentiates this from, like, say, like, just competency models where, you know, just like big collections of skills. Like, we need someone to, uh, you know, essentially be able to run our IT function or someone that can program. Who gives a shit, you know, what kind of 
programming language they use. How, mm-hmm. how would like, you know, specific skills, di- how, how would they be used differently, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a big question. And if you're an Iowa psychologist, you sh- you are probably have been asking yourself this question around, like, you know, around this new skills movement, um, as you've been hearing more and more about it. Like, didn't we already do this with competencies? Yeah. Or are, are we already doing this? What's the difference, right? So it's a great question. Um, and and I think it's, you know, honestly, I don't think it's wildly different. Like, I'm not going to make the argument this is something completely new and different from competencies. But I think that the HR industry as a whole has considered competency modeling to be a failure, right? And yeah. Uh, that, that was like actually now we have an opportunity to, yeah. do, to do it again and learn from all the reasons that it failed and do it better that that was kind of my perspective when it's like is is skills competencies 2.0 i'm like does anybody remember what we went through with competencies <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like do we want that again i don't know so so what were the things that what were the reasons that competencies were so disastrous um like so one was they took forever to build right the competency model took forever to build and once they were built they couldn't be changed so there was like so much rigidness no agility so we need to solve for that um i'd also argue that we didn't do a good job building competencies models that could be used across the life cycle so we'd like build them for selection and then it would be difficult to use them in a learning context because they were broad and they encompass personality (laughs) and character along with skills and so you know then you're like well how do you you need to be how do do you get someone to training on uh conscientiousness or whatever it might be right altruism (laughs) so i think that was there some breakdown there and then i think that we didn't always do a good job of what's the analogy we're hearing all the time now like uh, flying the plane while we're building it right like balancing the build, the long-term build of the infrastructure with actually showing value to the organization as we go along. So I think those are the things we have to do better with skills and that we're, we're equipped to do better because of the AI and the technology that's coming out. Yeah. Well, I noticed um, when we were corresponding about the podcast, <laughs> you had mentioned this recent article that came out from Mark Efron about, you know, is juice, is the juice worth the squeeze on skill-based organizations? And I wonder, you know, we briefly touched on this a few weeks ago, just like maybe five seconds, but I'm wondering, you know, what is your perspective on, on that, the premise of that article? Yeah, I think that the article rate, I mean, he has a lot of points, a lot of arguments against him, right? So, and I think, oh, I think some of them are, really great points i think some of them are just criticisms that you could make about almost anything that consulting firms are out there pitching right so things like um well like I, like one of the arguments is like we've gotten along this far without skills so what's to say that we really need it kind of reminds me of when people are like I don't know why people wear bike helmets. I never wore one when I was a kid. And look, I'm still alive. You know, it's kind of like one of those arguments. Um, uh, that they another argument that there isn't good but, evidence of ROI. But like, I, I kind of feel like that's true of mo- most consulting firm products. Like, you know, like. But but have we gotten by without skills? I mean, like we we hire people to form specific jobs i mean like <laughs> if you need a mechanic you can't just be like well you know they, they seem like a good person like like you need some sort of not, not to mix my ksa o's here but like you need some sort of mechanical ability some still you know or the skill to work on a like a honda you know as it were right like so we've always hired for skills we selected for skills we evaluated performance against skills well, and I'll, I'll build on that, Scott. I'll say the most anodyne thing ever, but I think this is controversial in the skills world, which is roles come before skills. So once you've determined what the roles are, then you can build people's skills within those roles. But there isn't a post-role world where there are no roles and all there are is everyone is just an amalgam of skills. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go back to the article real quick, though. I think the primary criticism without all the other window dressing that's in here, because this is a long article, um, 
is that the cost of these skill programs are obvious while the proposed benefits are diffuse, right? Which means the costs are up front. You see all the money you need to spend on these technologies, these consultants, these you know developmental programs or what have you to build a skill-based organization, all the time and effort that goes into it. But you never get to actually see directly, you can see maybe indirectly, but directly the benefits of this p- pivot. And so it's, it's very much like I, the old dictum, you know, if it's everybody's problem, it's nobody's problem. If skills is a solution for everybody, it's really not fixing anybody. And mm-hmm. I think that's that's really kind of the core of the criticism there. But I, I still think that there's a lot of there is juice to be squeezed in this the skills space. It's just I don't think there's a lot of new ground that's being covered either by what's being proposed. Other than hey, we can use AI to determine skills easier. That wasn't meant to be a mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, <laughs> the investment, the huge investment, totally fair, right? Do you really need to commit to the full-scale investment to start getting value out of skills, right? Um, I, I don't think you do. I think that you can start small. I think it's incredibly important with anything we're doing for organizations that we start with a pro- like a problem space in mind that we, we need to be solving a problem, right? And then we need to be able That's to- That's crazy talk. That That's crazy this, talk. This approach that we brought in, the solution that we brought in, solve the problem. So I think like small, uh, starting small, starting focus on specific problems you're trying to uh, fix, uh, you know, uh, address in your organization is the way to go rather than building up the entire infrastructure, spending two years and just countless amounts of money on, on that um, before you see value. Um, I think there there is some risk and some danger there because I, this is so new. Everyone's at the beginning of their journey, so we're all going to learn along the way. But I, 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 I think, oh, go ahead. Oh, wait, go no, ahead. no, 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 no. You, you were the expert here. So Please. I was going to ask about like a, a parallel in people analytics, right? So I, I think there's a lot of investment in the data structure of people analytics, and I'd imagine it takes a long time to get all that set up and get it right. And oh yeah, absolutely. Do people? You know, do you ever get questions like, is the juice worth the squeeze of this? Is, is the juice worth the squeeze? I, I think it's, it's, it's fair, but just like everything else in IO or research, it's like compared to what? Compared to what? What, nothing? Just random guessing going back to, you know, just subjective opinions or, you know, like who, who your nephew is? Uh, yeah, yeah, we could, we could go back to Stone Age, but there has to be some sort of uh, criteria. And just because it's not perfect doesn't mean it's not valuable. Yeah, I thought we had graduated as a society from nepotism, but maybe we haven't. I don't know. <laughs> I don't believe so. I, I think yeah. that's going to be around forever. Well, what what relationship, Jen, do you see with the, all the work in the skills space and even competencies and things like gig marketplaces and the future of gig work and you know, kind of the gig economy altogether, because I've seen those as kind of fellow travelers in this space where a few years ago, everybody was saying, you know, the future of work is gigs. And then it was the future work is skills and that'll enable the gigs. And then it was like, can we get the platform? So everybody is a gig worker. Um, How are those related? Right. So one of the big trends that also became an impetus for the skills work had to do with work becoming more and more fluid over time. Right. And so we started to question, like, is the construct of a job the right way to organize work? And is it even working now? Like, if you looked at your job description, does it describe the things you're actually doing day to day? Or if you were to tell someone about your job, would you talk about projects that you're doing? So most of us would talk about projects that we're doing. And so the gig marketplace just acknowledges that formalizes that right like let's stru- start structuring work in the form of projects let's put structure around it uh more structure if we're already doing it let's put more structure around it and let's put a system in place so that there's the opportunity for people to learn and grow from working on these projects there's the opportunity for the organization to optimize the extent to which they're putting the right 
skills and talent on these projects. And it's kind of a win-win, right? So we're getting the right skills in the right place. Um, and as an organization and people are also getting new and different experiences that they might have not or, um, otherwise had, which helps them to continue to grow their skills. And, and so that's, that's the, the connection there. Again, it's not super new. Like, like we've always known that part of learning and development is practicing a new skill with a project, with an actual assignment, right? So it's bringing that to life in a little bit of a different lens, I think. Space learning plus uh, uh, learning on the job, absolutely. But you, you, you raised an interesting question around, like, does your job relate to your actual uh, job description? And like, I, I know that I've engaged in a lot of uh, uh, job crafting. Essentially, gravitate towards the things that I enjoy and try to, uh, you know, get rid of a lot of things that I don't enjoy, whether it works out or not. Yeah. Uh, I have something like very related to that, Scott, that like what you're saying essentially in practice was a conversation I was having this morning with someone and they said they started their new job and their job description was one line, right? And what that did, and, and this actually is to the point that Jen was making earlier about using theory in our day jobs is immediately my, my thought went to the theory around role clarity, right? And that oh, being absolutely. Really key thing, the key indicators of whether somebody has, you know, job satisfaction or engagement or feelings of, you know, anxiety. <laughs> well, this person was feeling an immense amount of anxiety at that moment because yeah, they might have the ability to be empowered to craft their job, but also contextually everyone around them was saying what their job wasn't. So every time they tried to craft it to be something new, they ran into a new barrier. And I was like, like, someone else is already doing this portion, this sort of thing. (laughs) Exactly. And so you could think like, yeah, job crafting can be great in an environment of empowerment, but in an environment of hostility, man, that can be a real tough environment. (laughs) Environment of hostility. Holy shit. They they got other problems besides gig economy going on. I'm probably being a little hyperbolic (laughs) by saying hostility, but what I mean is it's just, it's a tough place to navigate. Uh, speaking of navigating, uh, tell us about Mayflower. I mean, it came over across the seas. <laughs> what a transition. Right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think this is a great platform maybe to, to make some more folks aware of Mayflower. Excellent platform. Well, yeah. What What is Mayflower and what's Scott joking about? How about that? Yeah. Mayflower is a phenomenal consortium that is focused on employee listening so it's all large companies with fairly mature employee listening program and they come together and they benchmark and learn from each other um, with regards to best practices employee listening but also broader right because you know i'm sure we've all owned or at least had large roles on employee listening programs in our careers over time i certainly had for many many years and you also get involved in a bunch of other stuff too. Like you get involved in people analytics and talent management and, uh, you know, what, what culture maybe you work or whatnot, right? And so the benchmarking becomes actually quite a bit broader than specific to employee listening, really all things um, HR, right? You know, and, and talent management, I'd say. What is this no, it you... is, yeah, uh, go ahead. Is it one of these groups where, you don't find us, we find you <laughs> kind of thing, <laughs> like a secret yeah, group or what is yeah, it? Yeah, like there is this really interesting secret society kind of aspect to it. Um, it like that has emerged or it did emerge in the past, right? Where it was a little bit like that. But we've definitely been, remo- you know, making an effort to remove that element to the organization and make sure that people see us as accessible and um and uh, you know welcoming and interested in bringing new organizations in we absolutely do i would say it is a really unique an incredibly unique um organization in the extent to which it provides a safe space for people to connect and really you know come together to solve each other's problems and uh it's been around for over 50 years just run as a voluntary organization, which I'm pretty proud of. And it's been really an important part of my career. I I should say I'm not involved in Mayflower anymore because I've stopped doing surveys and I've had a new company, but it's been a huge, really important part 
and something I've really cherished um, in my career so far. Also well, from an like, indie effects standpoint, you know, 50 years is a long time. And it's got 50 more years in it. Um, but do you want to do some confusion matrix, Scott? Let's yeah, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it pretty quickly. The confusion matrix. Uh, let's do some. How about some research roulette, Jane? This is the fun one. Sure. Can you tell okay, me the rules? So the rules are simple. I'm going to present you with three research studies. One is real, two are fake, and your task is to identify the real one. I got it. And if, you, it. if you get it right, you will be showered with uh, fame and glory. And if you get it wrong, well, we we won't talk about that. You'll get a social media towel from Cole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here are your three studies. Uh, study one, the impact of lunar phases on ripening of bananas. Uh, this is from the Journal of Agriculture in some institute in Costa Rica. Uh, study two, do ethicists steal more books? Uh, Philosophical Psychology Journal, 2009, uh, UC Riverside is the institution. And study three, Investigating the Sleep Patterns of Mythical Creatures, 2023 Cryptozoology Behavioral Science Review, Institute uh, somewhere in Scotland, Wildlife, some Institute of Scotland. Okay, so we got Lunar Phases, Ripening Bananas, do ethicists steal more books and investigating the sleep patterns of mythical creatures? Do, do who steal more books? I, I... Ethicist. So people that practice or, ethics. Or study oh. ethics. Study ethics. I guess practicing ethics would be a different sort of. Do you mind gotcha. if I weigh in here real quick? Well, what, yeah. What's your thought process? What's your thought process? Well, cool. I, I just have a thought about one of them, which is okay. the second one sounds so up my alley. I know it can't be real because it's meant to trick me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too much on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I think that I might agree. It might be the second one. The third, I think the third one is meant to to trick us, to, to make us think that to, because I don't know how anyone would study that. Like how, I mean, how do you study yeah. sleep pa patterns of a, of a creature that's not real? I mean, you could read stories about them, but then do they talk about them sleeping? Right. Sounds, like, like like in, so that's what's throwing me a little bit, but I'll go with two. I'll go with two. <laughs> two. Two is the real one. That's, that's what you're saying. No, I'll, you know what, Cole, you think t uh, two is the fake one. I'll go with three being the fake one. Oh, oh, oh no, no. Two of them are fake. One is real. Oh, only one is real. I'm sorry. Only one is real. Oh, I think the, the first one's real. The uh, impact of lunar phases on ripening of bananas? Yeah. I, think I, number, I thought it was number three. I'm just out of curiosity. Okay. Okay, both of y'all wrong. It's the do ethicists steal more books? So, <sighs> uh, let's see. I didn't take the bait. <laughs> <laughs> so, ethicists. Uh, esoteric ethics books uh, are likely to be borrowed from a professor's library. They began to study it about 50% more likely to be missing than uh, non-ethicist counterparts. Well, it uh, makes sense. I remember in grad school, we had this uh, counseling professor who said that, you know, from uh, what, what's the MMPI? Remember the MMPI? The yeah, of course. The multiphasic personality inventory. He said that cops and criminals have the almost identical scores on the MMPI. <laughs> which means if you're the kind of person who wants to study ethics, you're also probably the kind of person who's interested in being unethical. <laughs> you well, know? Along, with, along yeah. several lines, a lot of people go to like counseling psychology or gravitated because they want to fucking fix themselves. Right. Like yeah, there's something wrong with me. So I need to go into this field or fix someone around them. Fair enough. Fair. Yeah. Well, we want to do some nerdery. The nerdery. Okay, this first this first one's about mythical creature sleeping habits. And go straight into it. Wait, In the what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, where, where, where do you, where do you want to start, Cole? Um, maybe we'll start. Uh, I'll have to admit uh, for the listeners, I'm very underprepared today, but I'm going to try to wing it. We're um, struggle, struggle busting. What are we doing? We're going to struggle through this. So uh, this first one is um, from personnel psychology. 
uh, person, organization, fit, theory, and research. And the, the articles about some of the conundrums and conclusions that they've come to in this space of PO fit. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of explain the article real quick and then I'll have a little voiceover about it. But they go through, I think it's six different conundrums that are related to PO fit. Uh, one of which is, does PO fit actually matter? And they say that quite a bit, especially with regard to individual attitudes and turnover. But there are many caveats, including measures and national culture. And then is PO fit always desirable? For individuals, generally, yes, but there can be benefits of misfit. For organizations, the answer is still unknown, particularly with regard to diversity. And so yeah. that's really kind of why I brought this up originally, because there's been this uh, push in the last few years around culture fit being considered such a negative in relation to if you're wanting to create diverse cultures. But then there's whole body of research, which is much older than that notion around PO fit um, and it being a great blessing to organizations. And so I'm just curious, what are, you, what are your all thoughts on this article, but also that topic more generally? I think the way people can contribute to an organization is broader than just the tactical way they do their job, right? It's the way that they contribute to the culture as well. Um, the way they show up, yeah. the way they behave, the way they influence other people, and you know, um, and so I think that whether we call it culture fit or or um, organizational fit, I think those additional aspects um, that are more tied to the way that someone's going to contribute to the culture are incredibly important when you're thinking about who you want to bring onto a team and into an organization. So I guess I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of fit. For, fan of fit. For from a organization perspective, how about y'all? Uh, I, I, I would say that I, I don't know if we need this bifurcation between culture fit and PO fit. It, it sounds like it's the same thing. I don't know if it's okay. old wine, new bottle, if it's just essentially the same construct rehash. Uh, but th th there is something to culture and bringing in someone that will get along with the teammates, right? It, we know this uh, that uh, groups that are less diverse – tend to be more productive. They tend to get things done more quickly, this sort of thing. What you avoid by having diverse perspectives is you avoid disaster, right? You, you get uh, opinions that will sidestep or bring in new perspectives. You can be more innovative and this sort of thing. Um, uh, group think, whatnot. Uh, there's also something to be said about the person that's hiring for the job, knowing if that person will flourish in that job or be happy, right? Uh, so we're bringing you in because we, we see something or we're not bringing you in because we see something in you that would mean that you're, we're going to have to replace you in six months anyway. You're yeah. not, you're not going to fit in here unless they mean literally you're fit in the organization. Like you're too big to fit in the building. I don't know. <laughs> like physically too big. <clears throat> I, I think it's actually we're they're actually not talking about the same things. I conceptualize it as sort of a two by two chart. Is there PO fit? Is there not PO fit? Is there culture fit? Is there not culture fit? And there's really like one really good quadrant and one really bad quadrant, right? <clears throat> and the really bad quadrant is, you know, like I guess where there's neither, but you know, you can, you, there's, there's folk, like there's this, this concept of the concept of a cultural ad, right? So we, we hired this person. We think they're going to be a cultural ad to our company. But that person could still have PO fit, even if they're a cultural add to the organization. So that that's another quadrant that could exist plausibly. The, the I think the concern really exists, you know, where a person you know wants to be a cultural add, but that's being stamped out, right? They, this is not allowed in our organization for you to add to our culture because of your diverse background or whatever. Which is really crazy because um, you bring people in and be like, uh, we, we we love that your fresh ideas, we love your fresh perspective. Yeah. Be like exactly one of us. You're off culture. <laughs> it's like, okay, you, of course. Here's kind of the other side, which is I think the benefit of things like PO fit. Like I think back to, I think this was in the nineties when Apple had that ad about like think differently, or maybe it was the early two thousands. And what they were basically saying is we have a culture of people we want to bring in or an organization of people we want to bring in that of people that think differently. 
right? Mm -hmm. This is this is what we're about. This is our PO fit here. And you can have a vast array of diversity within that type of culture because many people can think differently in many different ways, but that would still fit within the bounds of PO fit. And so I think this is where the conversations of the culture fit and the PO fit talk past one another is they can't realize that it really is this kind of two by two chart. I'm not sure if I see the difference in the PO fit and the culture fit. No, maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong. I just don't know. Sure. You know, when you think about the studies, and by the way, that was that article is a blasting path. I've not thought about how the different ways in <laughs> yes. decades, I forgot that was a whole thing. Um, but anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is I think the research on culture fit at least 20 years ago or well, you know, 10, 10 to 20 years ago um, was assuming that the culture was not intentionally crafted, right? And that's where you might run into some issues because you're not being intentional about you know, the types of people you're bringing in and how you're going to make a positive contribution, you're just letting the status quo drive things, right? But but the reality is that organizations are being very intentional about the cultures that they're trying to create to support their business strategies and they're defining tenets of the culture. And I think if that is the foundation for your approach in selection, that is going to get you better hires, right? If you're like, you know, these are the three tenets of the culture at apple that's really important right yeah and you're hiring against those i think you circumvent the concerns about diversity and you are tying um your selection practices to your business strategy in an important way yeah well you mentioned it's a blast from the past it's actually from 2023 but um there are many blasts from the past that um you know are, like how popular they are affect um, how well cited they are. And so I think we've got an article to talk about just that, don't we, Scott? Listen to Cole with his transitions. This is fantastic. So this article examines how status of research papers affects the way they are read and cited. So we all get on Google Scholar and we kind of like, you know, do our searches and we look at citation counts. I know I do. And that serves as essentially a proxy of mm, quality, right? So these uh, researchers sought out to investigate this, and they used uh, data from 17,000 citations, and they did it a pretty unique way. Uh, they actually went out and just surveyed folks that had uh, put citations into their, their own research and asked them, hey, was this really foundational in how you thought about the paper, or are we just essentially using the citation as a... Uh, uh, you know, informative or just like pay homage to it. Essentially what they found is uh, for over half of citations, they have minimal intellectual influence on the way the authors think about the paper, uh, except for like highly cited papers. And for those papers with zero to 100 citations, citation counts do signal some sort of benefit. Like, so if you have a paper with one citation, not very good quality up to a hundred and you got uh better quality, this sort of stuff. Uh, anything else here? So displaying low citation counts may make papers appear to be lower quality. Papers with poorly perceived quality are read more superficially and discovered later in the research projects. Pretty interesting. So would it be fair to say it this way, Scott, that if you're not cited, you're definitely not an influential like kind of idea or article, but if you are cited, there's not a guarantee necessarily that you are influential. Is that fair? Or am I thinking about that wrong? It's, it's kind of like the, uh, the way I, I think about it, like the Matthew effect. So the rich get richer, richer. So like once a, uh, so it's a power law, another power law that we've talked about. It, it, there's definitely a power law associated with it, but the, that other tail is also important. So it does signal quality. The more citations you get on the lower end, and another, there's like social impacts here too. Papers that are shared with your peers. So if I say, hey, Jen, you really need to read this paper. You're going to read that paper more closely and more likely to read it and more likely to cite it in the future. So it's like the virality of academic papers. Almost. It is. It is. Uh, but it, it also lends uh, credence to essentially hiding those light, low citation counts. So you can be like, okay, uh, we will still give it some sort of uh, deference, even if it isn't highly cited. 
Right. As someone so, who's so, never received any citations, I agree. <laughs> you, don't have a, you don't have a Google Scholar page, buddy? It's empty. <laughs> oh, man. So, so, like, what's our takeaway? What's our practical takeaways from this article? The, it's, there's mean, not think, meant to be one. <laughs> I think so, but, like, in, in the world of academics, we need to measure performance, right, <laughs> of professors. And one way that we can do that is by looking at at how often they're cited and use that as a proxy exactly. for the influence they've had on their field. And I think the takeaway here is that that's a valid measure. We're, we're cool to keep doing that. Would, would you, am I understanding it correctly? Uh, unless you get super high citation counts when people just essentially cite it for context is, it has no real influence. It's, it'd be like citing, uh, I don't know. St Stodgill, I'll invoke Stodgill's name again. Like they're not really influencing how you think about things, but just we yes, trait leadership in the past, this sort of thing. Yeah. So would it be fair to say, Scott, like, um, like if you're the first person to write about a theory, you probably cited a lot, right? Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you're the seventh person, that contributions to theory is probably not that great, and so even if it's cited, it's not that influential. It's really the first article. And then if someone comes along and overturns the prior theory with some, you know, updated research, that's also probably a really influential one. But the seventh person who writes about the overturning is also less influential. Is that kind of a way of thinking about it? Potentially. I don't know. It's, <clears throat> it's about uh, quality and influence, as you say. Um, I was just trying to lean into like how, what impacts it could have, because really the impact is do some major groundbreaking research or overturn something from the past. And then that is an influential idea. But if you're just kind of, you know, carrying water for some other idea for a long, long time, yeah, you might get tenure, but you're probably not that influential. And you could also have one hit wonders too. Like I think like Gersick, you know, punctuated equilibrium, right? Yeah, I true. highly say, I don't know anything else she's done. You know, maybe, maybe she has had a great career. On the other hand, you have, um, uh, Oh God, why am I blanking? Uh, well, Casio, Casio, a, a million citations, highly, highly cited. Um, yeah. That might be a fair measure. But I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to show that not all, I think the, the, the real takeaway is like not all citations are made the same and we cite things for different reasons and just mm -hmm. having an overall citation count is, can be misleading, right? You could argue I'm a zero hit wonder, you know? <laughs> not even a one hit. Are we, is there a message in there around a risk that we're missing diverse, like diversifying our ideas as a field by not reading the low count one? I, I can't decide yeah. if that's true because you said they relate to quality. <laughs> so can we? Well, I think that that's what they're getting at by saying we should hide the uh, research with low citation counts because they're going to be overlooked if you look at just Google Scholar and say like, oh, Cole's got zero citations on this paper. I'm not even going to bother looking at it, right? But there may be some good information in there. I mean, Cole wrote it, so probably not. So we're you know just going to let that one go, right? Yeah. But yeah. if it didn't have a citation count, some poor sap may have read it. I won't be offended. <laughs> uh, Jen, I, I really feel like you're trying to give this article way more credit than it deserves. <laughs> but uh, maybe that's a good point to move on to our last one. Um, last Scott, one. Do you want me to pull up about video games? Let's do it. So this is actually quite interesting. So the study investigated the link between video game performance, especially these multi-online battle arena. I don't know. And what, whatever these are. And they call them MOBAs. Mo multiplayer MOBAs. online battle arenas. And they're linked between fluid intelligence. Uh, so previous research suggests that strategic game performance might signal uh, intelligence levels. And so they conducted two studies. One, they measured fluid intelligence and working memory uh, and compared it to League of Legends player rankings, which I guess, you know, some sort of like stack ranking. And study two, they examined the age profile and performance in these MOBAs uh, and what they found was that uh, there's a excuse me significant correlation between fluid intelligence and League of Legends rankings, but not working memory. And study two, they found that video game performance peaks around age 22 to 27, which is consistent with the trajectory of fluid intelligence. So these findings suggest that uh, game expertise, especially in these you know strategic games, 
uh, could serve as a proxy for assessing cognitive performance in global scales. Kind of it interesting. It could also be correlated with the amount of free time you have. You know, 22 to 27, that's like peak you know, people discovering. Oh, oh I got you. Time. I got you. you know? But I mean, the, the correlation with uh, raw fluid intelligence is uh, quite interesting with the player ranks, right? Because I mean, like, th- think about all the facets that go into just fluid intelligence or you know, the sub facets, you know, planning, strategizing, keeping things going, taking old information, and put it into a new context. That's essentially what these players are doing. I haven't done this in a long time. Yeah, um, I, I'll just say that the only variable I thought was missing from this, I think I wildly agree with it, is finger speed. <laughs> like speed. some people just can like move their fingers like crazy fast and agile to do well at these games. Other than that, yeah, this absolutely tracks. But I mean, like for for plumbing context, I mean, this kind of opened up the realm of. Uh... Providing people a novel sort of stimulus, uh, you know, novel context to gauge other sort of attributes that you may want to select on, right? I mean, Paul Sackett may disagree that we want to use fluid intelligence in our t- selection instruments, but uh, it's friend of the podcast, Paul Sackett. He, I'm so sure he would this- give us our blessing just because we're friends. Is this a case for like gamification or cognitive ability test? Is that where you're thinking, Scott? Uh, I am not making that case specifically, but yes, I, I think that it, it could be parsed over. Absolutely. What I saw is like when it came to gamification, it was like a bunch of gamers came of age and they're like, hey, we could do games in IO psychology. I, I think there actually yeah. is some validity there. The only thing that you run into is kind of the whole is the juice worth the squeeze? argument Uh-oh. there because building games is really you know hard and it takes a lot of money and resources and do you get the benefit um equivalent to the amount of resources put into it but i think it's absolutely a pathway for you know finding either confirming constructs we already know you know like like in t- fluid intelligence but also potentially finding new constructs that we haven't um haven't really tapped into before this could open up a whole new realm of uh skills assessment jen maybe yeah i I, i'm surprised you haven't done an episode on this actually because it's such a i think it is a hot topic gamification is it good or bad useful or not but but my understanding of the research is in the context of selection candidates don't like it they don't like it It, even though it's fun people don't want to feel like a decision about whether or not they're going to get a job is being made on how well they play a game right it just um, it does. It's, it doesn't feel appropriate for the content. That has been my read of the research, and I'm sure the vendors that make them would cool. really add. Have it. either <laughs> of you <laughs> seen the movie like Ready? Have you, either of you seen Ready Player One, the movie, or read the book? I know of it. Okay, because like I think everyone who is an advocate for this space think that you know th- because basically that's a whole gamified world. Like basically, video games turn into reality is like the premise of the movie. And I think everybody thinks like, well, you know, if we create gamification and selection, it'll be just like Ready Player One. In reality, it's nothing like that at all. If it were like Ready Player One, I think candidates would be totally on board. But it's just, that's not how it ends up working out. In reality, it's like, hey, write an email to someone and we're gonna judge how well you write the email. It's like, wait, this doesn't feel like a game. (laughs) This feels like work. Yeah. yeah, I always say they're not very fun games. <laughs> like, so that's part of the problem. <laughs> but um, but I, I think there's more promise in like non-selection context for gamification, like like training and development and like just motivating people to do the things you want them to do, right? Like like having like incentive-based games where you earn points for you know if it's developing yourself, you earn points for the the trainings that you do, and then with the points you can you know, be on a leader scoreboard and like that type of gamification, I think probably has more merit. Oh, it definitely works in like call centers and things like that. I've seen that deployed for sure. Um, I think there just has to be, and I'm sure there's been research on this. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but like there has to be a quick feedback loop between the, the gathering of the points and like the leaderboard or whatever is shown and the behavior you're wanting to see. 
if there's too long of a lag, it, it ceases to be effective. But anyway, take that for what it's worth. Well, Jen, you've been you've been fantastic having you on the podcast today. It was like a, a way back machine. Um, actually, we didn't even get to see how you, we talked about how you and I met. How did you and Scott meet? Scott and I worked together in previous job. We we did we did. I don't remember the exact moment that we met, but I definitely remember <laughs> that it was like a all hands or get together sort of thing. And we sat on the table, and Jen she said like the head of the table, and I sat next to her, and like within five minutes, like. God damn, this is like a powerhouse. It's an IO powerhouse. I'm sitting next to you. Super impressive. Yeah. She's amazing. She, she likes well, thank you. My memory of meeting you, Scott, is that you brought us like you brought us souvenirs from I did. Texas that I did. you had made with your mom. Were they like rocks or magnets or both? I, I I'm trying to remember what it was. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. I, I forgot about this. Yes, my, my mother was very crafty. I, I am crafty too, but I did not, I can't take credit for this. But yeah, <laughs> she made a uh, little like glass magnets for people. I thought yeah. you were going to say pet rocks. I was like, that's epic. No, I love it. No, pet rocks. <laughs> Why did I think oh, there was, well, yeah, maybe there was a, a rock aspect to what the magnet I'll, was I'll, like. I'll, I'll, send some, <laughs> I'll send you some fresh ones. Nice. Bring him to Diop. Oh, oh, that's that's next level. Okay, I will do this. Awesome. I'll start handling him out. It's, it's been a pleasure talking thought about that the other day because I went to my new company's headquarters in New Jersey for the first time, and I remembered how Scott had brought like a piece of of Texas with him when he came to Chicago, <laughs> and I brought Chicago souvenirs to my new team, inspired by you. So I didn't. My mom didn't make. Oh. Did I? They were bought from the store. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of like when you like you're, you're cooking, or like you just get like takeout. You got to put some flour on your face and be like, "Oh, I spent all this time making this." Scott, you're an inspiration to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> you got to you got to start the ingratiation uh, early when you get a new job, right? Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Jen, you've been amazing having uh, having you on here. Uh, before I give you the final word, Scott, any parting words for Jen? Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, where are we going to eat, Jen, in Chicago? Uh, are you looking for pizza? Specifically? Sure. Whatever. I don't care. But, you know, I think Chicago's famous for its, pe- for its pizza. There's always debates around what's the best Chicago pizza. My recommendation is Lou Melanotti's. Take it okay. or leave it. I think it's by far the best. I also just think Chicago pizza is like too heavy of a meal for the vast majority of situations. <laughs> Jen's Jen's walking me into like another great story. We got we got a couple of seconds here. So we we had a team meeting with uh, Rudy Gizek, uh, the great Rudy Gizek, and I don't know. I I think I sat next to Jen at this table too, but it's like I don't know twenty people total, and Rudy ordered like three deep dish large pizzas. In between ton, twenty people, we ate two of those pizzas and had an entire one left over and Rudy got the bill and it was like a hundred bucks or something like that. He's like, Jesus Christ, I just fed 20 people for a hundred bucks and I got entire pizza left over. This is amazing. It's costly. Really? <laughs> um, I, I was also going to say, if you're looking for um, suggestions of like a Chicago, a unique Chicago thing to do during your spy op time, yes. in addition to pizza, my recommendation is always to go to Second City, Chicago, because it's a uniquely Chicago experience. It's a sketch comedy club that is just, you know, part of the Chicago, you know, tradition. It's been there for a very long time and it has produced an unbelievable number of famous comedians. Like, if you were to name 10 famous comedians, of them would come out of Second City, I swear. So, so, Chris, so many. Chris Farley, David Spade, I believe they both came Tina through Faye, there. Tina Fey, Steve Carell, like the list goes on and on. The quality is really exceptional and consistently. I've never seen a bad show. And you can fit it. This is the important part. You can fit it into the nooks and crannies of your psyop time, which is unusual, right? Like usually if you <laughs> want to go something in your, in the destination of psyop, you're like, yeah, but like this it was only open during the day and I have to be at sessions, but second city is an evening activity. You can even do like the 10 o'clock show. So you can do all your receptions and be all done and then go over there. 
So that that's my top nice. recommendation. Pro tip. Pro tip. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh... You don't have to keep the podcast. <laughs> I don't know that everyone cares. <laughs> it's, it's great seeing you again, Jen. Absolutely. Yeah. It's good they they say know. Directionally Correct is like the second city of podcasts or something. I don't know. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I can say second tier. Yeah, second tier of podcasts for sure. Well, Jen, you've been fantastic. And uh, you've been listening to Directionally Correct, a People Alex podcast with Colin Scott and today's guest, Jen Diamond Acosta. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. Directionally Correct is dedicated to you, our listeners help educate and entertain you on how to effectively do people analytics. By supporting this podcast, you're helping us continue to provide valuable insights and knowledge to our listeners. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. You can find the link to sign up in the show notes or at patron.podbean.com slash directionally correct. Thanks for your support.